And then the next one was leaving Las Vegas. So I, I achieved what I apparently was supposed to achieve while I was in New York with him, which was a real tough shoot. It's actually the worst shoot I ever worked on. It's a miserable motherfucking shoot. I hated every minute of it. <laughs> tell us how you really feel. Yeah, yeah, well, I can tell you. Let's see, it's going to be very X-rated. You're standing there for hours to stand in. So what a stand-in does, and I was learning on the spot, was they ask you to not talk to the actor, to not uh, you know, do eye contact with the actor, generally speaking. This is a general rule. Mm -hmm. And uh, you basically do whatever the actor does. You're mimicking everything that he does. So you're standing in for the technical aspect of the film. So whatever he does, if he's walking towards the lake and sits down on a bench, for example, and, and lights up a cigarette and smokes and stares off into the wilderness, that's exactly what you're going to do. And you have to do it in the same character, in the motion that the character is in. And so I would study him being the character and they give you a script. So you feel like you're a part of the thing. You read the entire script. Then they have these sides and they're called sides, which is a mini me version of the script of what's being filmed per day. Sometimes it's one page, sometimes it's three pages, it just depends. And you look at that and uh, and then you see your character's name on there and that's the character that you're in, which in every day was Nick Cage because he was the star of it. So I had sides every day, I had a call sheet. The call sheet was basically for the crew and it's a daily um, list of who's on the, uh, on the show from all the crew members, from the director on down to craft service and so forth, right down to the extras. So it's kind of like a summary. And then they give you uh, a, a one and two day advance schedule on that call sheet. So you study those things. You, you try to memorize as many names as you possibly can in terms of crew. You uh, try to understand what these positions are. And the fortunate part for somebody like me to work for a lead actor is you get to be in the entire film. So you're in the continuity of the film. So I don't pop in and pop out to figure out, oh, what are they doing three days from now? Because I missed the first three days or because the actor's not in it. Nick Cage was in every shot and every scene. Yeah. So I had the privilege right from the get-go to understand how a film was being made, how they jump from scenes back and forth and back and forth because Cage was in all of them and to watch it through the monitor because I was representing the lead actor. In addition to that, so you had to watch him intensely. If he starts to run towards a sleigh, you run the way he runs. And they set up the cameras, whether it's a dolly track with the cameras in his in, in the motion that he does it, in his speed. So whatever he does in that rehearsal, you do as the character, as his character would do it. Sometimes I would start to assume the character's positions because they were small uh, setups. And then I felt mm -hmm. like I kind of had a grasp on it. And then they do the rehearsals with me because I felt like I was kind of on it already. And sometimes it's just such a still thing. Like if they're sitting in the sleigh, there's only dialogue and sitting in the sleigh. So there's not much, he doesn't need to go and rehearse that or set that up. Like I know mm -hmm. exactly what he's going to sit in the middle and sit on the sleigh. Like what else is he going to do? So, and that would take three to four hours, but you have to be in exact costume um, because the camera wants to feel the, um, not the energy, but the the uh, the mass of the other person as Nick Cage as well. Like I can't be a skinny toothpick and I can't be overweight. You really have to fit, fit in that bodysuit. So you can fill yeah. the frame the way Cage does. Um, the bad part is that Cage is has got a V-shaped body because he's really a worked out kind of Superman dude. And I'm right. kind of like straight down. So I always wore padded shoulders to really extend my thing. <laughs> right. Joan Collins, um, even though it was fashionable in the 1990s, I did that. So I just needed to do it because it would fill the frame. And he was so tall. And he was an inch and a half taller than me. And I would always wear lifts, even in the winter, and boots. And that I considered to be job security for starters. But also, it really aids the camera. So when there's a close-up, and he's six foot one, and that's how tall this man is, and plus his boots or shoes or whatever he's wearing, and you're 5'11 and a half, I wear lifts to accommodate that so the camera can actually size you up. So you're not like this, and then he comes in and they have to readjust and readjust. Reverse Tom Cruise. Now, Dave, I don't know if you know this. I know he knows this because he's a stand-in of it. Did you know that Nicolas Cage was all, also once almost Superman? Yes, I did. 
Oh, you did know that. Were, question: Were you almost a stand-in for him in that? I was. I did the costume fitting in that in that outfit. I saw you then, so I met you before I met you. I thought I was a nerd, like a like a fan nerd or something like that. <laughs> so you, you mentioned 1994, but what I'm going to do is uh, 1995, one year after Trapped in Paradise, you reprised your stand-in role for Nicolas Cage in Kiss of Death. And I, I've been practicing that, by the way. You like that? Mm-hmm. Kiss of Death. And at what point did it become apparent that you might become this might become an ongoing thing with you and Nick? Uh, once I did Leaving Las Vegas. So to be clear, I did all those films in one year, 1994. All of them were shot in 94 and released in 95. Um, Shot them back to back. So he had asked me to, once I was with him for about a month, he was very quiet. He didn't say a word to me. It was freezing fucking cold. In his defense, and people say, oh, he must have been such a cold guy. He's not talkative. Why should the actor go in and talk with all the the crew members and and uh, and the standards and everybody else? Like he has to focus first of all on his line. Secondly, he's got to have that dynamic between the other actors. Um, thirdly, it's minus fucking twenty outside, so everybody wants to shoot their scene and go indoors. And this is a fact. When you put those things together, you understand why he's not a very talkative person at three o'clock in the morning when you're standing by a frozen lake. People are like, oh, he's not talking to you and you're the stand-in. He doesn't have the obligation to talk to me. You know what I mean? That's not his fucking job. And so I always defended that. And people said, oh, you're just being nice. I'm not. Because if I was the actor, I would have done the same thing. Because here's the thing, guys. What if I got fired after two or three weeks because I was an idiot, which happens mm-hmm. all the time. So does he have to go in and chum me up with every standard that comes in for two to three weeks and and put all that energy forth and hopefully that this guy is going to actually be a decent stand-in? Put, you know, think about it in his shoes. So yeah. and I was cool with all of that stuff. My job was to work for him and not to be a buddy system. And so as it turned out, he came to me on that set and, and asked me to go to his trailer and have a conversation about a, a longevity career about working for him. And this was right on Trapped in Paradise. And I immediately say yes, once he asked me, but I didn't really understand what that meant. Cause I also didn't understand this was a full-time gig. I thought it was something very passive. Um, and I also didn't have anything else going on in life guys at the time. I think if I did, I wouldn't have taken the job, but I had, first of all, no money. I had no career. Uh, I was being paid somewhat decently at the time. And he said, the next film was going to be in New York. Do you mind putting yourself up? Do you have friends out there? And I said, yeah, I have friends. Could you stay in their apartment? Because it was a low budget film called Kiss of Death. And uh, but we would like you to be in New York. And uh, we would like, you know, to have you there as, as my as my stand in. So what I didn't know, guys, is that he was testing out my ability and my commitment to him. It took me a long time to figure this thing out because I wasn't that um, I, I, I didn't think that far ahead. He was already mm-hmm. light years ahead. And what he was doing was building up an entourage. And I had no idea. I just thought it's something out of a whim. And I thought, okay, this is kind of cool. And uh, and I thought the worst case scenario is, okay, I'll put myself on. I'm not going to make any money, but I'll learn about filmmaking. Because, well, you're on a film set and you have the privilege of sitting next to the director and a cinematographer, which nobody gets to, uh, to do unless you're in that position. Um, I thought there's a lot to be learned. And yeah. so... I thought, okay, I'll do it in New York. And then the next one was leaving Las Vegas. So I, I achieved what I apparently was supposed to achieve while I was in New York with him, which is a real tough shoot. It's actually the worst shoot I ever worked on. It's a miserable motherfucking shoot. I hated every minute of it. <laughs> tell us how you really feel. Yeah, you know, I can tell you. Let's see, it's going to be very X-rated, but <laughs> yeah, overall. But then um, I did very well with it. I was very professional as he was. It was, you know, something you don't want to be on really. And then the next one was leaving Las Vegas, like within weeks. And um, and I had to put myself up in LA because it was an extreme low budget film. And I had friends in LA because I was that failed actor way back then. So I took that one as well. So this is film number three, all in the same year. I'm really making just enough money to survive, but it wasn't so much about the money's about as it was about the learning curve and the process of filmmaking. 